Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 095. This is section 7.8. We're going to look at special factorization. Now, before we delve into this, we have to recall the content that we looked at in section 7.5. 7.5 was special products, where we dealt with uh, perfect square trinomials, the difference of squares. Uh, and these tools of special products will help us when we look at special factorization. So the first thing we're going to look at is a perfect square trinomial. If we recall from section 7.5, <clears throat> if we have a perfect square binomial, it gives us a perfect square trinomial if we were to FOIL this out. Now, if we look at this, the first term is squared, the last term is squared, and the middle term is twice their product. And the same thing if we have the, uh, the difference of terms here. If it's a perfect square trinomial, the first and last terms are squared. And the middle term is just minus twice their product, or negative 2 times their product. So if we can recognize a trinomial to be of this form, we can simply jump right to this factorization. The other methods we looked at in the previous section, 7.7, .7, will still work. But if we can make this recognition, it's going to make our uh, work a little bit easier. And to be honest with you, to recognize these special products and how they factor is going to take practice, lots of practice. So um, be aware of that. And one key is to know your perfect squares and your perfect cubes. That does help when it comes to coefficients. All right, so let's look at this first example. I have x squared plus 18x plus 81. Since my coefficient is 1, I could just look at the factors of 81 and determine which one sum to 18 and factor it, just like we did in the previous section. But I recognize, obviously, the first term is squared because it's x times x, x squared. The last term is a perfect square. If I recognize the first and last term to be squared, I can check the middle term to see if this is a special product. Is this twice? the product of the first and last term. Well, 1 times 9, which would be the square root of 81, the number being squared, 1 times 9 is 9. Is this value twice that? 18 is twice 9. So this is a perfect square trinomial. Perfect square trinomials come from perfect square or squared binomials. So a squared binomial of what? Well, 1 x squared is x times x. 81 is 9 times 9. And since this is addition, it tells me the sign in between them. If I take x plus 9 and square it, I will get this value. So essentially, I'm just working it backwards. And it was a single step only because I recognized this to be a perfect square trinomial. It factors to the square root of the first term, in this case it was x, and the square root of the second term, in this case 81, gave me 9. So I can jump right to this, and that can save me a lot of time, but I have to learn how to recognize these terms in our trinomials. Let's look at this one here. We have x squared minus 12x plus 36. I recognize 36 to be a perfect square. It's 6 times 6. Is this value twice? 6 times 6. Twice, or excuse me, twice 6. Twice 6 is 12. This is a perfect square trinomial, which if I square a binomial, I get a perfect square trinomial. So what are the values in here? Well, x times x is x squared. And 6 times 6 is 36. The sign in between them is determined by the sign here. If I square this out, I'd get x times x for x squared. I'd get negative 6 times x. x times negative 6, well, that would be negative 12x if I can combine those as like terms. And negative 6 times negative 6 is 36. So it's a really quick method to be able to factor a perfect square trinomial. Sometimes we've got to be a little careful because it's not always going to be 1. And we've seen that when we looked at things that maybe we applied the AC method. Well, here I have 4x squared y squared minus 28xy plus 49. I recognize that 49 right away to be a perfect square. It's 7 times 7. This one maybe not as uh, forward 
to be a perfect square. But I look at the coefficient, and I say, well, 4 is a perfect square. Well, so is x squared, and so is y squared. So this whole term is made up of perfect squares. Now, is this the product, twice the product, of those perfect squares? Well, this would be 2xy. 2 squared is 4, x squared is x squared, y squared is y squared. This would be 7. If I multiply these together, I'd get 14xy's. Is this twice 14xy? 28 is twice 14. Yes, it is. And it would be negative. So 2xy minus 7 is my squared binomial that would give me this when I multiply it out. All right, let's look at this one. This one, we see it has a negative 12, 18, and 14. Well, none of these are perfect squares. Well, one thing I should always check before I begin factoring is, do my terms have a greatest common factor? Well, of negative 12, 18, and 14, I recognize all those values are divisible by uh, 2. So maybe I want to factor out a 2. And I like my first term to be a positive value, so I'm going to factor out a negative 2. Are there any other common factors? Well, I have an r cubed, an r squared, and an r. They all have at least one r, so I'm going to factor that value out. We have an x squared, an x squared, and an x squared. They all have an x squared. So I can factor that out. I have a greatest common factor. So if I factor it out of every term, term negative 12 over negative 2 would be a positive 6. And then if I factor out an r, I'm going to get r squared. If I factor out x squared, there would be no more x squared. It reduces to 1. 1 times this value doesn't change. If I factor a negative 2 out of this, well, factoring out a negative is going to change its sign. This would become 9. Uh, we factor out one of the r's and both x's, so that just leaves one r. And then here, we factor out a 2, which would leave us, or a negative 2, changes the sign and gives me a 7. I factored out the r, and I factored out the x squared. So now, we look at this and say, hey, this is not a perfect square trinomial, so it's not a special product. Maybe we would try other methods. Maybe I'd try the... AC method, 6 times 7 is 42. Are there factors of 42 that would uh, have a difference of 9? I don't believe there is. So this is as far as we could factor it. So maybe initially we might think there's a perfect square, but take out that greatest common factor, and we'd say, oh, no, we don't have that there. So we're going to stop right here. All right, let's move on. Let's look at a different type of special factorization. And that's when we have the difference of squares. Again, from 7.5, if we have uh, the multiplication of two conjugates, a plus b, a minus b, their only difference, we call this the sum and difference of terms, if we're multiplying those together, the middle term cancels out. We have a positive a times b. We'd have a negative a times b when we combine like terms that middle term drops out. And we notice there's no middle term here. We have the first term squared and a last term squared. This is called the difference of squares because that's exactly what it is. It's a difference of squares. They always come from the product of their conjugates. So if I know that and I can recognize perfect squares, I look at this and say, well, this is x squared, which is a perfect square. 25 is a perfect square. Since I have the difference of squares, I can write its conjugates. Well, this would be x plus 5, x minus 5. And to check my work, I could FOIL it out. x times x is x squared. Positive 5x and negative 5x. No x is in the middle. 5 times negative 5 is negative 25. So I would get that back. So if I can recognize this to be the difference of squares, I can factor it into its conjugates. Let's look at this one here. Now, this one here, we have 4y squared minus 36z squared. I recognize both of these terms to be squared. But to make my life a little easier, I'm going to stick to that rule and see if there's any greatest common factor. Between 4 and 36, they have a common factor of 4. So I'm going to factor out a 4. And that's going to leave me with y squared minus, if I factor out 4 from this, I get 9z squared. 
So now my coefficients are much smaller, and smaller coefficients are easier to work with. Now if I look at it, this term is still a perfect square, and this term is a perfect square. 9 is a perfect square, and z squared, of course, is a perfect square of 3 and z. So since I have the difference of two squares, I can write it as its conjugates. And whenever you factor out a greatest common factor, it comes along for the ride as, as long as we're still factoring. It should be there in your last answer, in your final answer. So <clears throat> since these are perfect squares and it's a difference of squares, I'm going to write it as y plus 3z. If I square this value, I'd have 9z squared. If I square this, I'd have y squared. And this value, because they're conjugates, I just change the sign in between them. y plus 3z times y minus 3z. If I FOIL this out, I'll get to this. If I distribute the 4, I'll be right back there. So I can check my work. Definitely do that. Now, if you didn't factor out that 4, these are still perfect squares, and you could have jumped to its conjugate, but it would not be completely factored because it would still have a common factor that you could take out of each one. All right, let's look at this one. We're talking about factoring completely. And I know x to the fourth, even though it's to the fourth power, it's still a perfect square. If I take x squared times x squared using my rules of exponents, I would add them together x to the fourth. So a value times itself is squared. This is a perfect square. So if x to the fourth is perfect square, y to the fourth would also be a perfect square. This is the difference of squares. Once I've recognized that, I can rewrite it as x squared minus y squared times x squared plus y squared. Now notice all the other ones, I put the positive first and the negative second. When it comes to these conjugates, order doesn't matter. And here's why. If I, it's the commutative property of multiplication. If I have 2 times 3, I'm gonna, it's the same thing as 3 times 2. It doesn't matter which order. So you can just put them in there. Make sure that their signs are different. The uh, difference in sum of terms is the same as the sum and difference of terms. All right, now we're asked to factor it completely. And I recognize something. Once I factor it, I want to check my work. And I notice before I do that these are still squares. And it is the difference of squares. The difference of squares factors. And I might think for a moment that this would factor too, because these are still perfect squares. But there is no such thing as the sum of squares. It does not factor in the real number system. This is something that we would call prime. So if you see squares and if you're able to identify those, check that sign. We can only work with the difference of squares when factoring, not the sum of squares. All right, so this does factor further because it's still a difference of squares. So of x and y, so I write their conjugates. Now, this term I can't do anything with because it's prime. It just comes along for the ride, just as if it were a greatest common factor. And this is the completely factored form of this value right here. How can I find that out? I can check my work. I can FOIL this out, and I'd get x squared minus y squared. And if I multiply it by this value, I'm going to get right back to that. If we look at that middle term, x squared minus y squared would give me negative x squared y squared. Positive x squared y squared, that middle term cancels out, leaving me with this term squared, that term squared. And that's what we have, the difference of squares. All right, what about this one here? Well, if we recognize that there is no way to factor the sum of squares in a real number system. This is prime. There's nothing I can do with that. It is what it is. I leave it alone. I would maybe just write that it's prime. I cannot factor it. All right, let's look at another thing that we saw in 7.5. Or actually, we did not see this in 7.5. This is a new special product. If I have uh, a times b, and I'm multiplying it by a squared minus ab plus b squared. If we think about this, it looks similar to a perfect square tri trinomial, except this is not twice the product of a and b. So this is uh, a special one. We call this the sum of cubes, and we call this the difference of cubes. What I would recommend is to put this formula to, m to memory. Identify your perfect cubes, be able to recognize them, and know this formula. 
But the nice thing about these two different formulas is you don't have to actually memorize both formulas. If you know one of them, you can associate the other. If we have the sum of cubes, we'd say, well, what multiplied by itself three times? That's our a value. What multiplied by itself for three factors? Well, that would be my b value. And if I recognize that, if it's a sum, I just have to alternate the middle term here. So if this is a sum, I make that a difference. Because they have to be of different sign in order for some terms to cancel to leave us with a two-term binomial. right? And if you know the positive one, well, the negative one is you just change this sign, and you'd alternate the middle sign. So if this one's positive, that's negative. If this is negative, that one has to be positive. So if you know one of them, you can associate that to the other. Just change the sign in, in the middle. All right, so let's look at one. How would I go about factoring it? Well, the first thing to do is recognize perfect cubes. x cubed is a perfect cube of x times x times x. What is 27? Well, if we think about it, if we were to factor this down, it would be 9 times 3. And 9 is 3 times 3, so this is 3 factors of 3. What I recommend when you're first learning how to uh, factor the sum or difference of cubes is to actually take an additional step and write it out as x cubed plus 3 cubed. This will help you be able to identify, well, what is my a and what is my b? Well, my a here is the x, because that's what's being cubed. And my b is the number 3. If I cube 3, I'd get 27. So this will help you recognize that. Now I'm ready to factor it using that formula. a plus b, the first term squared. Oh, actually, I have values here. I should be writing them in. x plus. 3, that would be my first term, my a and my b, my a and my b, times the first term squared, which would be x squared, minus, because I've got to alternate that sign, their product, 3 times x, a times b, 3 times x. And then the last term squared, 3 squared, is 9. So the first term squared minus their product plus the last term squared. That's what this formula says. So there we have it. It is factored as far as we can go. And what's nice about the sum or difference of cubes, you might think, hey, this right here might factor because it's a trinomial. This will always be prime. So that's kind of a benefit. We get it to this point, it is fully factored. Let's look at another example. This one here is the difference of cubes because I recognize 125 as 5 cubed. So the first thing I'm going to do is write it as 5y cubed, because both this 5 is cubed and the y is cubed. So I write it like that. So now I know my a value is actually 5y, the two of them together. Now, the nice thing about the number 1 is it is the perfect any power number. It's a perfect square, cube, fourth power. Any power, 1 is the perfect number, so to speak. So this is 1 times 1 times 1. I'd still have 1. So I'm going to write it out as 1 cubed. So now that I have my a term determined and my b term determined, I can use the formula. a, which is 5y, minus b, which is 1. And then in this set of parentheses, the first term squared. Well, 5y squared would be 25y squared. And I have to alternate the sign, because that's what the formula tells me to do, plus because they have to be different in order for middle terms to cancel out. The product of these, 1 times 5y, is just 5y. And the last term squared would be a positive 1. This last term is always positive because it's a perfect square. If you square a negative, you get a positive. If you square a positive, it remains positive. All right, let's look at this one here. If we look at this one here, we have 24x to the fourth minus 81xy. Cubed. Well, I recognize 81 as a perfect square, but I don't see any variables that have squares. And I look at this and say, well, 24 is not a perfect square. So maybe I think, well, I'm done and I'm going to move on. Absolutely not. The first thing we should always check is for a greatest common factor. 24 and 81 are both divisible by 3. So if I divide 3 out of this, I'm going to get 8. Oh, and they also have an x. So I can factor out a 3 and an x. 
So if I factor out a 3x from this, I get 8x cubed. If I factor out a 3 from this, I get 27y cubed. And now I look at it and I can assess it. And guess what? It is the difference of cubes. 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. 27 is 3 times 3 times 3. And of course, x cubed is a perfect cubed and y cubed is a perfect cubed. So if I'm going to factor it, remember what we said before. If you factor out a greatest common factor, it has to come along all the way until your final answer. So it has to be there. So my a value is 2 and x. And I'm skipping the step where I'm writing this as uh, 2x quantity cubed. 2x minus 3y. And then the next term here in the next set of parentheses is this squared, 4x squared. Alternate that sign. So now it's plus. Their product would be 6xy. And the last term squared would be 9y squared. And now this is fully factored. And notice we have this factor, this factor, and this factor, because this greatest common factor is still in my final answer. So this here is the fully factored form of this right here. All right, so let's uh, go over here. And we're going to essentially just sum up our strategies for factoring that we've seen in the last few uh, vi lecture videos. The first step you always want to do is check if there's a greatest common factor. If you pull that out, it may make your value smaller and more manageable. Definitely do that. Otherwise, it's not going to be in a fully factored form when you get to the end. The second step is if it has four terms, hopefully we recall when we have four terms, we attempt to factor by grouping. Group the first two together, factor out something common, factor out from the second two uh, values. And maybe we'll see that they, too, have a common factor. And then we could take it further. The third one is, if it's of the form x squared plus bx plus c, notice this coefficient is 1, then all we have to do is find the factors of c that would sum to b and rewrite it as two binomials. When we get here, what if that isn't 1? What if we have a? Well, if it's of this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, we can use the ac method or trial and error. And honestly, I'm not a fan of that trial and error. Use that ac method. It'll get you there every time if it works, if it is factorable, if it's not prime. All right, the next step is, if none of those uh, meet our criteria, if the first and last terms are perfect squares, check for a trinomial square. Is it a perfect square trinomial? Is the middle term twice the product of a and b? All right, then uh, the next step is, if that's not the criteria, if it's a binomial where we have just two values or two terms, check for the difference of squares, which we just saw, or the sum or difference of cubes, which we just completed. So look for those squares and cubes and determine if it's a binomial, will it meet those criteria? And then the last one, always check your work. Multiply it back out. You should get to where you started. That's how you know that you did it right. Check your work. All right, so for the last thing I'm going to leave you with is I'm going to ask you to do these four problems right here. It says try these. We have. Uh, something of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. We have uh, x squared minus 14x plus 49. You know, check these, use these methods, see what you get. And uh, just a hint on this one, maybe you can see that it is a, uh, a cubed value, 2 cubed, right? 2x cubed, we saw that, right? But what do you notice about 8 and 64? If you can factor something out and make your coefficient smaller, that's going to make it a little bit easier uh, when it comes to finding your values. So go ahead and try those four on your own. Good luck, and thank you for watching.